don't want to forget her. I don't want to forget anything about her. And when I can't remember the sound of her voice, I need to hear it. It's just an amateur CD that I have. And I just stick it on and I can hear her little squealy voice for a few seconds. And that's it then, a couple of seconds and I just stop. You know, I can see her. It's just sometimes I can't hear her. I forget what her voice sounds like. Then I hear a squealy voice. That's it, that's it. Nicola Furlong was a 21-year-old woman from the small village of Curraclo in County Wexford. It is around 8 kilometres northeast of Wexford town. It is also a three-minute drive to the beautiful white sandy beaches of Curraclo, which is famous for its soft fine sand which stretches for miles. But our case is not based here in Ireland. It is Japan we are visiting today for this terrible crime. Nicola was born on the 17th of December 1990 she was described as a hard-working, quiet girl who was popular with her friends. Her family would say Nicola was a warm, stunning, generous person who always had time for her family. She always stood for everything that was good in life. Nicola was a DCU student on an exchange programme in Takasaki, a two and a half hour train journey north of Tokyo. Nicola was a bit of a home bird, but was studying Japanese and business and to improve her Japanese, she decided to go to Japan, along with her friend Sarah, who was also from Wexford. She was a little unsure whether to go, but her family encouraged her. Nicola did keep in contact every day while she was away, even flying home for her 21st birthday, and she stayed until after Christmas, as it was her favourite time of the year. On Wednesday, the 23rd of May 2012, Nicola and Sarah were getting ready for a night out. They had gotten tickets for the Nicki Minaj concert in Tokyo. While getting ready, Nicola was messaging her mother of the excitement about going to the concert. Angela, Nicola's mother, smiled to herself as the messages came through, as she imagined the great lengths her daughter was going to, to have her makeup done, tan and the perfect outfit. She knew her daughter was a girly girl and everything would be perfection. Angela was also excited as she knew her daughter was due home in 10 weeks. She would be home for good. This would be the last day of communication Angela would have with Nicola. In less than 24 hours, Nicola would be dead. The next morning, the 24th of May, back in Wexford, it was just another day for the furlongs. Angela was in work and her ex-husband Andrew was getting ready to open the pub and restaurant he owned, Furlongs Roadhouse in Curraclo. As Andrew was still at home, he heard a knock on his door. It was the guardie. When seeing them at the door, he thought it was in relation to something minor. Never did he think that they were coming to tell him his eldest daughter was dead. The guardie didn't have much details of how Nicola had died, except to say there may be foul play involved. Angela would later describe getting the news of her daughter's death. I just fell to the ground. The noise came out of me wasn't human. It was just a shock. It was horrendous. I'd never forget that morning. Roughly what happened? Um, not my baby. Not that way. No, not that way. They wouldn't find out the circumstances of Nicola's death for two days. On the day of the 24th, Nicola's body was taken for post-mortem to try and establish how she died. The police declined to give information to the press but they said the death was being treated as suspicious and they had two men held for questioning. It was established that Nicola and Sarah had attended the concert, but it ran a little late. When they arrived at the train station, they had missed their train. Stranded and having to wait for the next train, they got into conversation with two Americans. They were in Japan working with a touring musician. Richard Hines was a 19-year-old talented keyboard player from Memphis, Tennessee and was known as a dedicated Christian who moved to Japan in March of 2012. James Blackston was a 23-year-old professional dancer from Los Angeles. He had a large social media presence across Twitter, MySpace and YouTube. They took the girls to Scramble Pub in the Shibuya district, where they danced and drank, and later went back to the hotel rooms. Later that morning at 3.20 a.m., another resident of the hotel rang down to reception complaining of noise coming from one of the rooms on their floor. A member of staff entered one of the Americans' rooms and found Nicola lying on the floor unconscious, 
with Richard Hines, the 19-year-old, also in the room. Nicola was rushed by ambulance to a nearby hospital, but died shortly after arriving. Sarah, Nicola's friend, was found in another nearby room of the hotel and was also in a bad way. It appeared she had been attacked also. The two Americans went voluntarily to the police station. It emerged that visible marks were found on Nicola's neck and they said she had been sexually assaulted. They were also waiting on toxicology results for the level of alcohol in her system, along with if there was any drugs taken. Hines and Blackston denied any allegations put to them, but CCTV would tell a different story. Sarah's family, meanwhile, had flown out to Tokyo to be with her. The police authorities were keeping their cards close to their chest, not even confirming how Nicola had died. The Irish media also couldn't get answers and their Japanese counterparts told them that the police would only release information to certain media outlets. Back home, friends started leaving tributes on Nicola's Facebook page as word started getting around of her death. Within days, Hines and Blackston were being detained on holding charges for assault while police continued their investigation. Under the Japanese legal system, police are allowed to hold suspects for 10 days without any court appearance. After this, it is commonplace for a holding charge, a charge related to a minor incident or part proof of a more serious crime, will often be put in place to allow further detention. This is what happened in the case of Hines and Blackston, in relation to the two assaults on Nicola and Sarah and Nicola's death. On the 27th of May, they were charged with indecent assault in relation to Sarah, while 23-year-old James Blackston was named Richard Hines, 19, was not, due to his age. Under Japanese law, you are not an adult until you turn 20, so Hines was deemed a minor and so could not be named. The police set out the charge, quote, These two men allegedly took advantage of a female, unable to resist due to the fact she was in a comatose state from a highly alcoholic beverage on a taxi ride between Shibuya and Shinuku. They took advantage of Sarah, by touching her in the genital area of her body. As this was an indecent act, they were charged with quasi-forcible indecency. When the two were charged, Blackstone's social media accounts were all shut down. Again, only few details were released to the media. The report said that the taxi that brought Nicola and Sarah with the two Americans had CCTV, and witnesses had come forward stating that they saw the two girls being pushed into the taxi. People in Wexford rallied to help the Furlong family. They raised €100,000 to help bring Nicola home and to help with the cost of attending the trial. By the end of May, the process of bringing Nicola home had begun. The police didn't want Sarah to leave Japan for the funeral in Ireland, as she was a witness, but she persuaded them to let her go home for her best friend's funeral, on the understanding that she would return. On the 31st of May, Nicki Minaj tweeted her sympathies to the Furlong family and also denied reports that Blackston was one of her backup dancers. On the 1st of June, the Furlong family gathered at Dublin Airport and watched as their beloved Nicola was transferred to a waiting hearse. Her dad drove her home as he had promised her he would do. When they reached Corriclo, neighbours, friends and family lined the streets, standing with their heads bowed in silence. When Nicola arrived at the funeral home, she was placed into a bubblegum pink casket before being brought to her home for a final time for friends and family to say goodbye. The family did not have Nicola's funeral until the 3rd of June as they wanted to keep her at home as long as possible. In Ireland, it is custom to have the wake on the day of death and buried the next day. So one night and two days, depending on the circumstances, on this day, Nicola left her home for the last time and was brought to St. Margaret's Church in Curraclo. A guard of honour was provided by the local camogie and football clubs. Students from the Loretto College, where Nicola had attended, wore pink in her honour. A box of pink ribbons sat outside of the church for people to wear also. Nicola's childhood sweetheart was one of those who carried her coffin from the hearse to the church. Nicola's younger sister, Andrea, spoke at the funeral and said how her and her sister had planned to grow old together, how they planned to go shopping together with their walking frames 
and how now she would take that walk alone without her by her side. After the ceremony, Nicola was buried in the small cemetery adjoining the church. In Japan, the police had 11 more days to keep Hines and Blackstone detained in Tokyo, as there were two 10 days granted for continuous questioning. It was reported that intense interrogations were applied in order to get confessions, and they also gathered a mountain of evidence in order to secure the convictions. CCTV, witnesses and physical evidence was gathered. The conviction rate at the time in Japan was 99.8% and rarely a case was brought to court unless it was a slam dunk in getting a conviction. So obviously they had enough evidence to bring Hines and Blackston to court and secure the conviction. Blackston's lawyer told the media that he last saw Nicola when she was entering Hines's room and he did not see her after that and he had no idea or nothing to do with what happened to her. On the 8th of June, Andrew, Nicola's father, travelled to Japan to speak with police. It was to give a victim impact statement. He was expected to stay for four days and gather as much information in order to help everyone at home to find out what exactly happened to Nicola in her final hours in order to bring some kind of closure. Andrew had consulted with senior guardy in order to draw up a list of important questions to ask the Japanese police. Andrew had to provide information on Nicola and her stay in Japan and they also visited her rooms at the university where she was staying. He also had to state to police his desired outcome if the police were successful in a conviction against Hines. Blackstone's lawyers were firm in their client's innocence in the death of Nicola. He was not present in the room and he did not know what was to happen to her resulting in her death. Andrew arrived home to Ireland on the 12th of June wearing his daughter's rings on a chain around his neck. He was also allowed to bring home her laptop as it had recent photographs of Nicola and her stay in Japan. Andrew was well looked after in Japan by the university and the embassy consulates. He said he was able to get some answers about what happened to Nicola the night she was killed but wasn't able to say too much about the case. The Japanese reporters said they had received information that 19-year-old Heinz had admitted that he had put his hands on Nicola's neck but had not meant to kill her. In Japan, Heinz had still not been named because of his age but it was reported that his family in Tennessee were trying to get him home since his detainment. There was also reports of CCTV footage of Heinz and Blackstone wheeling the two unconscious girls in wheelchairs provided by the hotel through the hotel lobby and to the bedrooms. The police sources believed the girls' drinks may have been spiked and Nicola may have been killed after she woke up in the room being sexually assaulted by Heinz. On Friday the 22nd of June, formal charges were laid against Heinz for the murder of Nicola. On the 17th of July, it was reported by Irish newspapers that Blackstone was facing further charges of an incident that occurred a month before Nicola's death. A Brazilian woman had come forward stating that she had met Blackstone on a night out and had accepted a drink from him and was brought back to his hotel where she was sexually assaulted. When Hines was brought to court, the Furlong family had to apply for special permission to attend the court hearing. It was explained that Hines's legal team may object to their presence, that their presence may prejudice the judge overseeing the case if Hines's family was not also present. This permission was granted. The Furlongs expressed that even though it may be a short first hearing, it was better to be there than not, to hear everything firsthand with the help of an interpreter. The first hearing took place in family court and not a criminal court because of Hines's age. The hearing was four hours long and it was to see if Hines should be tried in a full adult court. Evidence against Hines was heard as well as victim impact statements from Nicola's family. It was announced the next day that Heinz would be tried in adult court. In December 2012, proceedings began for Blackstone's trial for the indecent assault on Sarah. A barman from the Scramble pub gave testimony that both women were intoxicated and in different states of consciousness, and one of them was found passed out in the bathroom of the pub. However, he could not say which woman was in this state in the bathroom. On the 19th of December, Sarah would take to the stand and give evidence of what happened that night, to the best of our knowledge, via video link. 
She said everything that happened that night changed her life for the worst. She now suffered anxiety and found it hard to breathe. I take it that she suffers from panic attacks. She said that her and Nicola had been approached by Hines and Blackstone at the train station. They had been friendly and agreed to go to a club to dance and have a few drinks. Sarah had said they had offered them one of their hotel rooms to stay the night, but the girls said no. They just wanted to have a good time and get the train at 6am back to their university rooms on campus. Sarah said she remembers blacking out at some time at the club. She and Nicola had gone to the bathroom and when they got back there were four drinks on the table bought by the two men. After they all took these drinks, she had no memory of what had happened. The only thing she was aware of next was Nicola being put into an ambulance. The main focus of the defence towards Sarah was how much they had had to drink that night, including at the concert. Sarah refused to look at the CCTV footage of the taxi ride back, as it would be too traumatic. Blackstone testified in his own defence. He denied the accusations against him, including the ones made by Sarah and the Brazilian woman. He said that when the four had left the club, he had to help Nicola to walk. He didn't feel responsible for Nicola and Sarah, but wasn't going to leave them on the street either. He said that the two girls had downed a drink each while they were waiting on him and Hines to return from the bathroom. I thought it was only women that went to the bathroom together on a night out, not men. Blackstone said he was offended when Sarah thought he was inviting her to have sex with him back in his room. The taxi footage shown next would undo his goody two-shoe persona. It was disgusting how they spoke about the girls in the taxi and how Blackstone groped Sarah as she lay unconscious beside Nicola. For some reason, there was no toxicology report submitted by the prosecution to show if the girls' drinks were spiked. Blackstone's lawyer said the footage showing the back of the taxi ride was inconclusive and said that Sarah had lied in her testimony to hide the fact of her attraction to Blackstone. Because of this, the lawyer asked for a not guilty verdict. The prosecution, however, clapped back. Sarah had no memory of the events after they had a drink with the defendant and his friend. They said thanks to the CCTV footage and witnesses, it showed that Sarah and Nicola had been brought to the hotel against their will and there was no evidence that she was interested in Blackstone. Blackstone got the opportunity to address the court and he said he was sorry for what had happened and that his fiancée and his family were waiting for him to return home. In February 2013, the Furlongs arrived in Japan for the trial of Heinz for the murder of their daughter. They were expected to stay for three weeks in which the trial was to last. In the meantime, Japanese law had an overhaul when it came to sexual assault and victims' rights. They have what you call citizen judges or lay judges alongside professional judges. The citizen judges tend to be harsher in their view of the perpetrators involved in a crime of a sexual nature. The Japanese are apparently unique in that the panel consists of six citizen judges chosen randomly from the public. Together with three professional judges who all come together for a single trial. They do not form a jury separate from the judges like in a common law system but participate in the trial as inquisitorial judges next to professional judges in accordance with civil law legal tradition. Hines would not only be cross-examined by the prosecution but by the citizen judges and the professional judges. Japan also holds the death penalty but it was unlikely Hines would get this because of his age and the circumstances of the crime. The death penalty is only usually used in the circumstances of multiple murders. On the 3rd of March 2013, the trial finally began. It was heard by six citizen judges and three professional judges. Hines submitted a statement stating that it was likely that he had pressed on Nicola's neck while having sex with her, but had not meant to kill her. The defence said that Nicola had most likely died from an overdose of drink and drugs. The prosecution had a different take on what happened that night. He said that Hines and Blackstone got the girls drunk and may have drugged them and brought them back to their hotel in a taxi where Hines had strangled Nicola with a towel. The barman on duty the night in Scrambles pub recalled the girls had three tequilas and been bought vodka and Red Bull but wasn't sure if the girls had drunk them. Stills were then shown of the camera inside of the lift of the hotel. It showed Nicola in a wheelchair appearing unconscious. 
the duty manager gave a statement that when the taxi arrived at the hotel, the two girls were unconscious and he arranged wheelchairs for the girls to be brought into the hotel. This part infuriates me. The girls were not residents of the hotel and were not checked in or in any state to be checked in, but they let these two bios bring them to their rooms. Not only that, but they aided them to do so. The duty manager also stated that in the early hours of the morning, he was summoned to Heinz's room following a complaint about noise. He knocked on the door and when he was let in, he saw Nicola lying on the floor. He saw that Nicola's lips were white and he began CPR. Next, CCTV footage from the taxi was shown in court. Only people involved in the case were allowed to see it, but the public gallery could hear what was being said. These are actual quotes between Hines and Blackston in the taxi on the way to the hotel. They could be heard laughing and saying, quote, they couldn't believe how fortunate they were that these two Irish girls had fallen into their lap. Hines also said, quote, we got to keep them fucked up. Blackston said, quote, we are going to fuck them, leave them in my room. We are going to fuck them. That's it. And send them on their way. The video also showed them fist bumping each other as Hines leant into the back where Blackston was with the unconscious Nicola and Sarah. It also showed Blackston groping Sarah. Nicola's parents were visibly shocked by what they saw on the tape and I'm sure they wanted to reach out to their daughter and rescue her from these monsters. Their daughter and her friend taken total advantage of. It doesn't bear thinking about. The toxicology reports showed that there was Xanax and lidocaine in Nicola's system both those drugs had been indicated in previous date rape cases. Reports had also shown that Xanax had been prescribed to Nicola before for treatment of mild anxiety and that lidocaine could have entered her system if it had been applied to her throat to help her breathe while she was in hospital, unconscious and unresponsive. There was also blood stains found on a bedsheet and a towel, which was a match to Nicola's DNA. The autopsy results showed that Nicola had suffered in her last minutes of life. She had scratch marks and abrasions, which were likely to have happened while she struggled to save her own life. There was internal bleeding and a five centimeter mark around her neck. It was the pathologist's conclusion that a soft object had been placed around her neck to kill her, like a rolled up towel. The defense questioned the pathologist and asked him was there any alternative reason for cause of death. Specifically, had Nicola died from the mix of alcohol and drugs in her system. The pathologist said that she did not just die, she was killed. He also stated that if Nicola died from her system shutting down, she would have had respiratory failure and there was no evidence of this. The doctor from the emergency room that Nicola was taken to also gave evidence. He said they tried everything they could to revive her. When asked about the needle marks that were found on Nicola's thighs, the doctor explained that they had a trainee doctor trying to take blood samples and he picked quite a difficult place to take blood and several attempts were made. Sarah gave evidence next of what she recalled the night Nicola was killed. It was done by video link elsewhere in the building of the courthouse. She had said they had met the two Americans outside the train station when they were approached by them. They had asked the girls where they were going, which directly contradicted the statement Hines had given who said the girls had approached them. Sarah again was asked how much they had to drink that night. She said they both had mixed drinks at around 750 ml. A third of that was vodka and the rest was fruit juice. They also had a drink at the concert and two tequila shots at the bar with the men. She said she remembered nothing after the second shot. She did say the two men invited them to stay at the hotel they were staying at but they declined as they both had boyfriends and just wanted to return to their rooms at the university. Sarah said the two men were friendly and because they were in a public place, they didn't think it would be risky to hang out with them. She also said she had never blacked out from drinking before, although she did say she was at a house party once and forgot where she had left her shoes. Sarah spoke about Nicola through tears. She said she was the kindest and gentlest and most generous person she had ever met. She was an amazing person with such a bright future that she can't have any more. She also said she was angry at Heinz for not showing remorse or not taking accountability for what he had done. By now, Heinz's family had made an appearance and were sporting bracelets with, in which we believe, printed on them. 
They had been selling these bracelets in order to drum up support at home in Memphis for Heinz. Heinz's ex-girlfriend also gave evidence to support his character as a good person. She had been 17 and he 16 when they dated for 11 months. She told the court that she had ended the relationship and not he. She said that Heinz had done nothing wrong and he was a sweet and thoughtful person. He was a very gifted musician and a devout Christian. The two had never fought in the course of their 11 month relationship and never saw him get angry or drink alcohol. The prosecution then read out portions of the conversation between Heinz and Blackstone that was had in the back of the taxi, which would stand alone in showing the other side of Heinz. Heinz's ex-girlfriend refuted what was read out, saying she knew everything there was to know about him and that they had been together a long time and she knew him inside out. Correct me if I'm wrong, but dating someone for 11 months at 17 and him being 16 is considered a long time and time enough and mature enough to know someone. Pull the other one. Another musician and friend of Heinz took to the stand and he was known by the name D Mac. He testified that he had called Heinz in the early hours of the 24th and an intoxicated sounding girl had answered the phone. Heinz then explained to him on the phone that he was having sex with the girl and she passed out. Heinz rang him back later and told him the girl was now unconscious. D Mac then went to the room and put a wet cold towel over her face to try and wake her up, but to no avail. Heinz would then take to the stand and explain his background. He said he was a professional musician and the musical director at his church. He also said he was involved in other activities within the church and his community. I take it he's trying to paint himself as a choir boy. He again told the story of what happened the night he met Nicola and Sarah. He said the two girls approached him and his friend Blackstone at the train station. He said the girls asked them did they speak English. He did admit that they offered the girls their room in the hotel. He said the two girls became very drunk very quickly and felt in good conscience he couldn't leave the girls there. He also said the conversation that he and Blackstone had in the taxi was said in an ironic way and he didn't mean what he said. The defence asked him was it normal to speak like he did within his peer group and he said it was. Heinz said that when he got back to the hotel and was in the room with Nicola, he refused to have full sex with her because he didn't have a condom. He said because of this, Nicola shouted at him. He said that Nicola had asked him earlier to put his hands around her neck and he did this to please her and also to stop her shouting. Don't you notice that nearly every woman that strangled to death had asked for it to be done by the person that killed them? Now that's what I call ironic. After a while, he heard her breathing go strange and saw that Nicola was losing consciousness. Nicola didn't seem afraid. She didn't resist or didn't appear she was suffering. The evidence would beg to differ. Explaining away the blood on the bed, Heinz had said that Nicola had vomited and there had been blood in it. After she finished vomiting, they resumed having intercourse, as you do after vomiting. He then told the court that he told police that he had pressed on Nicola's neck for no more than 30 seconds, but officers had taken down the length of time wrong and put two to three minutes. He also admitted that police had found an unused condom in his pocket, but couldn't remember where it came from. The furlongs were deeply distressed during Heinz's testimony and had asked the court to tell Heinz to stop referring Nicola as Nicky, as Nicola was never known by that name. If it wasn't Nicola, it was Nick. So disrespectful. The next day, Heinz was cross-examined by the prosecution. Heinz admitted he had put both hands on Nicola's neck. The prosecution asked why he had not told the court the previous day. He said, quote, nobody asked. It was also the first testimony that he admitted to this. It was in no other court documents. Heinz was then asked, did he understand the pathologist's results? that Nicola had died from prolonged hard pressure on her neck. Heinz said, quote, if I misjudged the pressure, I humbly accept it, if I misjudged it. It was also put to Heinz, why was all their clothes still on them if they were having sex? That, of course, Nicola initiated. Heinz explained that's how Nicola wanted it. He had gone along with it because, quote, he was a gentleman. He also testified earlier 
that he had not touched Nicholas' chest or groin area. This, too, was because he was a gentleman. Asked if gentleman puts his hands around someone's neck and applies pressure, Hines replied, that has nothing to do with being a gentleman. Oh, give me strength. When asked about the taxi ride back to the hotel, he said they brought the girls back there so they could rest, that he was being a gentleman once again. The Furlong family put a question to Hines through the prosecution. They asked, why did Nicola die? Hines said he had no answer to the question. He was asked, did he know how much suffering his statements caused the Furlongs? His answer, quote, they came across the world to know what happened. What do they expect? This concluded the trial testimonies and the victim impact statements were read out that evening. Andrea, Nicola's little sister, told the court she was angry and that it should be a life for a life, referencing the fact that murder was a capital crime in Japan. Angela, Nicola's mother, said that Heinz hadn't shown any remorse for what he had done and he also tried to blacken Nicola's name. And even though she doesn't agree with the death penalty, the sentence should reflect the pain Heinz put them through. On the 13th of March 2013, closing remarks were made. The prosecution pointed out that Heinz had shown no remorse and in order to save his own skin, he made out Nicola to be promiscuous. He violated Nicola's dignity and called for the maximum sentence to be imposed. Because Heinz was 19 when this happened, the maximum sentence was 5 to 10 years. The defence said there was not enough evidence to convict his client that the pathologist's results were biased against Heinz. Heinz then addressed the court again, or should I say he spoke to the furlongs directly. I may warn you all, this to me was the worst part of the trial and a pure mockery. So strap yourselves in. Heinz, quote, I am glad that I believe in the same God as you, and that makes my heart happy. He then said, quote, Mrs. Furlong, it truly saddens my heart to look over and see you crying. Mr. Furlong, it pains me when I see you red with frustration. I look you dead in your eyes today and tell you, your daughter did not suffer. In my short little life, the then 19 year old said, I have never hurt anyone physically or verbally. Addressing Nicola's parents, he said, it takes faith for me to believe that nothing good, bad or ugly will go through me without going through God first. The prosecution objected to the fact that Heinz comments were directed to Nicola's parents. Heinz then told the judges that he often cried himself to sleep at night and assured them that he was aware of the emotions involved in the case. He said he was not, quote, a strangler, murderer or a pervert and he did not believe he killed Nicola. Angela spoke to the press after the court retired. When asked about Heinz speaking directly to her, she said it angered her that Heinz put himself and them in the category of sharing faith in the same God. Angela also said she felt bitterness towards him as he sat at the trial showing no remorse and then shocked when he addressed them directly. She and her ex-husband Andrew also felt that now the trial was over they may never know what happened to Nicola that night in the hotel room. Blackston was back in court to find out his fate regarding Sarah and the woman from Brazil. The first victim said she had been at a bar drinking with Blackston and passed out. When she woke up, she felt so dizzy and sick that she thought she might die. Blackston told the court that the two women had lied and any contact that had happened had been consensual. Initially, he had told the police that there had been no contact with Sarah whatsoever. But then when he was confronted with the CCTV footage, he admitted that there had been sexual contact with Sarah. Blackston was found guilty and handed down a three year sentence with labour, with 150 days deducted for time served. The verdict for Hines came in on the 19th of March 2013. The judge said all Hines's explanations for what happened were irrational and that it had been a ferocious and vicious crime. Heinz then dishonoured Nicola with his account of what happened. The maximum sentence of five to ten years was imposed, with 121 days deducted for time served. The judge acknowledged that the Furlongs would have wanted a longer sentence, but his hands were tied because of Heinz's age. After the sentencing, the Furlongs spoke to the press again. Angela was pleased that the judge had cleared Nicola's name 
and had said the version Hines had given as to what had happened that night was lies. The Furlongs told the press that they were now going home to begin the process of mourning their daughter properly. Angela would later state in an interview that it was important that no trace of Nicola was left in Tokyo and Japan as a whole. She said she has everything that belonged to her at home, including the clothes she was wearing the night she was murdered. The only thing that was missing is one shoe that they never recovered. Blackstone appealed his sentence, but it fell flat and he was released in 2015 and deported back to the US, which he had to pay for himself. Hines did not lodge an appeal and spent the full 10 years with labour behind bars. The five to 10 year sentence is to allow the prisoner to serve the five years minimum and get out before the 10 years if the person shows remorse. Hines served the full 10 years. In other words, he showed no remorse. He was released in November 2022 and deported back to the US, again paying for his own flight. He was classed by prison authorities as a class three when it came to rehabilitation, just one above no hope of rehabilitation. This was based on the prison's improvement program, ability of atonement and reflection and sympathy with the victim. He failed miserably. After Blackstone's release, he has reportedly said it was, quote, an unfortunate and embarrassing incident. He said he has been overwhelmed by the support he received while in prison. He posted on his Instagram account, along with the selfie, that he was looking forward to having a blessed year in 2016. Quote, Today is the first of many things for me, the inception of a blessed and great year. I strongly want to kick it off with a special thank you to all my friends and family, also all those who stuck by my side throughout my time in Japan. Yes, it was an unfortunate imbroglio all around. He went on to say that the horrific crime was down to the work of God. But no God allows certain things to happen so that his glory shines forth through us special utensils. Please know I am overwhelmed by all the love and support given me. So I say to y'all, I love you all more than words can explain. I've found a few words for this scumbag who has been living it up in LA, where he has been rubbing shoulders with the A-listers on the Hollywood celebrity circuit. Blackstone was recruited by the rapper Chris Brown, who assaulted his ex-girlfriend Rihanna, to perform as a backing dancer in his music videos. What I say to that is, the devil looks after his own. On the 28th of December 2022, Heinz friend posted a video of Heinz playing the piano to a backing track, quote, and here he is, Richard Heinz, my little bro, is back and in full beast mode. Y'all turn my boy up, he ready. Nope, I won't be doing that. When Andrew and Angela returned home after the trial, they contemplated in suing the hotel for negligence. The hotel denied any allegations of breaking any Japanese law by allowing the two men to bring Nicola and Sarah to their hotel rooms while they were unconscious. The Furlongs argued that they were obliged to keep a record of guests and since Nicola and Sarah were unconscious, they could not have been able to check them in and therefore should not have been allowed to stay at the hotel. However, failure to do this was simply looked at as an administration error of hotel regulations and the hotel was fined 5,000 yen less than 50 euro. But for the furlongs, it was not about suing the hotel for money. It was for acknowledgement that they should have done something for the girls. They were clearly in a bad way and an ambulance should have been called for them. But instead, they prepared wheelchairs so these two lowlifes could wheel Nicola to her death and poor Sarah to an assault and the death of her friend, which she will never get over. With all the money that was raised, a hundred thousand euro in total, when all the expenses were covered, there was still seventy thousand euro left over. Some eight thousand euro went to the Nicola Furlong Scholarship at DCU. The remainder was donated to six deserving local causes, four people who needed life-changing or life-saving procedures, and two local groups which provide support for those with autism and MS. Andrew would say, quote, there was such an outpouring of grief and support from the Irish people. Our family will never forget that. He would also say that he bumped into a woman in Tesco's a while back. Her child's life had been saved by the money donated. 
she came up and thanked me. So it's some comfort that there is that legacy for Nicola and that legacy is forever, that will live on in those other young people's lives that were changed and saved. It is also a legacy to the people of Ireland for their kindness towards the memory of my daughter. Cuhan Angle, meaning Angel's Harbour, a memorial garden at Wexford Harbour for parents who have lost children through tragedy. It was inspired by Nicola, but not just for Nicola. At the time of the unveiling in the two weeks prior, five Irish families suffered the loss of their children, four of them here and one in the UK. Anna Kreigel, Justine Valdez, Cameron Riley, Robert Elston and Garode Gaffney. It is somewhere else for the family who cannot face the grave. It is for parents of children who died in all different circumstances. Murder, caught deaths, car accidents and suicide.